Good morning. Take this time to pray for the list of things on the back of this uh, bulletin and just to realize that our prayer before the Lord is like incense before him. He treasures it. He listens deeply to everything we have to say, even the deepest thoughts within our hearts. So not one word ever goes unheard. Let us pray. Father, we pray for our nation and our president, the people that serve around him, the people in our Congress. Lord, you know all the plans of the wicked and you know that they will not prosper. We pray, Lord, that justice will be served, that truth will always prevail. We know that thy word is truth and you are pleased with those who operate in faith seeking your truth. Lord, we pray for those that protect us physically, our military, our police, and all those that serve in the front lines and hospitals and fire departments, EMTs. Lord, all those that are putting themselves at risk on a constant way. We pray, Lord, for your covering and hedge and protection over them. Lord, for individuals on this list, the college students, all the people that are listed in these families and individuals, we pray for each one. Lord, you know the details of life. You know the details of the heart of each individual that's listed. God, the people that are not on this list, the people in this very congregation, Lord, pour out your comfort, your encouragement, your power upon your people. Let us be reminded that we sit in the heavenlies with Christ and that no one can ever thwart your plans. And we know, Lord, that your plans are to prosper us spiritually, not plans for calamity, because your people are precious in thy sight. Lord, we especially pray also for church leadership, for this one here in this local assembly and all churches, that they stand for truth, that they stand for honor and integrity of your word to be preached in its intended purpose, to go out with power, to reach each one that the leaderships would be in prayer for those that preach, for each other, for integrity of living. Because we know, Lord, we are fallen creatures. We know, Lord, that we fall short of the glory that you require. So we pray, Lord, that you would impart that power in your people to pray for one another and for the churches, for young people, Lord, as so many things are tugging in their lives for their attention. God, we pray that you would be the center and the focus of each young person, that your love would just be so overwhelming that it cannot be denied that the young people today would see the temporal love of this world pales in comparison to the eternal agape, unconditional love that comes from you and you alone. In Christ's name, amen. I see these special music markers, but there is no special music. It's my turn. Okay. Thank you. You're, you're up. Okay. Well, we lost one of the markers. Yeah. Good morning. This morning's first scripture reading from the prophet Nehemiah. I'll be reading verses 38 through 43 in chapter 12 of Nehemiah. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 482. Again, the 12th chapter of Nehemiah, verses 38 through 43. Nehemiah writes that the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall together with half the people past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall over the gate of Ephraim the Jesaniah gate 
the fish gate, the tower of Hanel, and the tower of the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate, as the gate of the guard, at the gate of the guard, they stopped. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God, so did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Eliakim, Messiah, Miniamin, Micaiah, Ilional, Zechariah, Hananiah, with their trumpets, and also Masasiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzi, Jehonan, Mal Malkajah, Elam, and Ezer. The choirs sang under the directions of Jezariah. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. May the Lord add his blessing to the attempted reading of his word. <laughs> Our second reading this morning is from the third chapter of Colossians, verses 15 and 16, on page 1144 of the Red Pew Bible. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning again. Let's pray before I start. Thank you. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity Thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. Thank you, Lord, that you give it to us with the grace that we need to accept it and take it in. Because truth alone is like a sword. It cuts and it wounds, but your grace brings healing and causes us to be sound and whole. Lord, we don't want a part of you. We want all of you. So we thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do through each one of us as we go through life and continue to walk with you. In Christ's name, amen. I titled this, Sing in Response. Most people sing and make melody in their hearts based on what's happening to or around them. Some people dance and sing with great excitement at weddings to the songs they like and they're jumping around and acting silly and having a wonderful time it's a response to what's happening you wouldn't do that just walking down the street or people will think you have a major problem <laughs> but in a wedding in that setting it's perfectly acceptable because you're responding to the excitement and the joy of the day some people sing the blues when they are low when they are disappointed or discouraged and they do this, I'm not sure why, but I think it, misery loves company. So if they're in a terrible way, they sing discouraging things. I don't know why again, because to me I would do something opposite of that. But people do that, and it has inspired great uh, songwriters to write many song, blues songs. We consider now, in some of the scriptures prior to our portion, how God looks at his servants and for our portions here, the singers. In Ezra chapter 7, in verse 24, it says, We also inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the Nathanium, or the servants of the house of the God. In Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 1, it says, When the walls when the wall was rebuilt, I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I read that and I said to myself, I need to look at this further. Why would a singer be appointed to the doors 
they going to sing at the door? What, what, what is that for? What gain do they have? But basically, the reason why these two groups were appointed, the single largest group that populated the city at that time were the priests. And you would think they would be leaders. But at this time, they were not loyal to God. And you say to yourself, you, you, you're kidding. The priests, the very people that were given by God in the Old Testament to lead the people to minister before God in the Holy of Holies, the priests, they weren't loyal. Nehemiah knew who was loyal to God and to him. And it was the singers and the Levites. Nehemiah was preparing to return back to the king in Persia because that's where he came from. He got permission to go here. And the king gave him that permission to set up the walls and take care of the city and get things organized. So he was taking the utmost precautions to leave Jerusalem's security intact. The singers and the Levites' experience as guardians of the temple pointed them out as the fittest persons for this task. Now our portion in 1028. It says the rest of the people the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God. That's why these singers and these Levites were called out. They knew that they lived just like we. But this is so relevant. People think the Old Testament has no relevance. We live amongst, as Isaiah said, amongst people of unclean lips. We hear it, we see it all the time. We live in this world, but yet we've called, we're called to be separate. Why are we called to be separate? God knows our nature. And if we don't separate ourselves up here, not physically, we have to work with unbelievers. We go to school with unbelievers. Some of our very family members are unbelievers. We don't physically separate, although sometimes we may. But up here, in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, we know that we have to be separate. Because if not, we will fall prey to the same things that the world does, the world thinks, the world says. We will be like the mob that yelled out when Jesus, who was perfect, crucify. As, as detestable as that sounds to the Christian, God knows that we will fall prey to that. So he called us, he called them out then, and he calls us out even in the New Testament to be separate. So, and the reason why these people did, the Levites and the singers, they had knowledge and understanding. It wasn't just passion. Passion is important. Without passion, we're not driven to do things but without the knowledge and understanding, our passion, as you can see the way the world goes, will drive most people off a cliff. In Nehemiah 10.39, the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, of the new wine, and the oil to the chambers, there the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers and the singers, thus, and this is the point of this. Thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. See, their house was so important to them because God called it out as separate. He had an inner place and then that inner holy of holies and only certain people could get into certain areas. The court of the Gentiles is where other people could go, but there was limitations, and the limitations would have put a mindset in the people that God was holy, and he was to be approached in such a way as to be reverent toward him. So he set up these physical things in the Old Testament to teach us a spiritual truth. God has made a way through Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean he's not holy. He still is holy. He's separate from the base things of this world and the base thoughts that we have. So when we approach a holy God, we must remember that he is holy. 
Take a look at Nehemiah 12 now. These people, these groups, are not to be distracted. In verse 27, at the dedication of the wall, they sought out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem so that they might celebrate the dedication with gladness, with hymns of thanksgiving, with lyrical songs. That word songs, it means lyrical. It wasn't just music accompaniment. It was the words. Because again, without knowledge and understanding, we don't have direction. We need knowledge and understanding. And then our songs, our passion, will be real and directed correctly. So these lyrical songs to the accompaniment of cymbals, harps, and lyres. So there's nothing wrong with instruments, but when the instruments become the prime mover in a church or in our hearts, we're in error. It's an error. It's a grave error because now it's just passion without the knowledge and understanding of what we're singing about or the portion we're looking into. A man named Clark said, they sent for the Levites from all the quarters of the land that this dedication might be as solemn and majestic as possible. It is likely that this was done as soon and as convenient as the walls were finished. The de dedication consisted in processions of the most eminent persons around the walls. Thanksgiving would be given to God who had enabled them to bring the work to a happy conclusion. In addition to all this was added a particular consecration to the city of God. So it's like any project. You finish part of the project and you may be happy about it, but that project is now part of this whole thing. So although they finished the wall, it was part of them as a community. It's like when this building was refinished. I remember talking to Pastor Jerry about it, and he was saying, you know, once the building was finished, it was going to be great to have everybody all together in this. And that celebration wasn't just a finishing of paint and shades and trimmings. It was the culmination of everything that went on to bring the people together again to have the focus on God. It's the same thing that's going on here. This was such a celebration. It wasn't just about the wall being done. It was about this city belongs to God and we are his people. And that's why it was such a celebration. The people had made earnest acknowledgement that God would take the city under his guardian care. He would defend it and its inhabitants against all their enemies. So everything and everyone was prepared in verses 28 through 30 of that portion. Then in verse 31, I had the leaders of Judah come up to the top of the wall and I appointed the two great choirs. And it's in verse 31 where it says the great choirs, great was large in magnitude and intensity. And the word choir, again, because we live in America, we think of a choir as a bunch of people with robes and they're all going, ooh. And it's just, you know, a lot of people think that. The choir here had a specific intention. This choir was designed to sing songs of confession. It's like, who would have thought that? But again, you have to, sometimes we read the English words and we have an Americanized understanding. But this choir, they, was, they were to sing confession. They were to sing praise, the purpose to give thank offerings and sacrifice of thanksgivings to God. That was the purpose of these two great choirs. And then down in 38, the portion we read, the second choir proceeded to the left. 39, it went by, it told, we talked about all the places it went by. The two great choirs in verse 40 took their stand. When you, t in the Bible, when it says it takes their stand or so-and-so took their stand, that means they present themselves. They're planted. There's a foundation that they're standing on and they're presenting themselves standing, which means nothing will move them. They're in agreement with what's happening. So they took, the choirs took their stands, they presented themselves and they stood firm because they knew they had understanding what they were doing. Verses 41 and 42, I will not attempt to replicate the beautiful job the reader did reading all those names. 
But it says in that portion in verse 32, the, the verse 42, the singers sang. And on that day in verse 30, 43, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. See, we sing in the church setting or when you're home in response. If it's a, if it's a God-centered thing, it's because something God has done. When we sing in response to what God has done, the soul healing comes into the spirit and the soul. There's a oneness with God that connects because you're giving God his due. He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. It doesn't matter if whether we agree with it or whether we feel like it at the time. He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise all the time. All the time, when we're sleeping, we're not doing much, are we? He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise while we're sleeping, while we're angry, while we're happy, while our minds are far from him. He is worthy. It says in verse 43 that this excitement was so passionate and this joy that even the women and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. I live not too far from the local high school in my town and not recently because of the restrictions with the virus, but when we had football games up there, I could hear the screaming and the yelling when there was a touchdown. Oh my gosh, the passion and the excitement of the crowd. And I thought about that when I was reading this portion and I, I wrote this down as a reflection for me and for anyone who hears, there should be more excitement in the church than at a sporting event or a concert because of what our God has done. It doesn't mean we jump around and make ourselves look foolish and cause confusion in the church, but there should be such an excitement in here and in the mind, in the spirit of the, of the child of God that is so passionate and so excited that everything else becomes secondary. And again, it's a reflection of what God has revealed to each one. So my excitement and my passion cannot be judged against the person sitting next to me. Why aren't you excited? Because God had revealed something to me personally, and this person hasn't been, hasn't been revealed. That person, they have their own hallelujah chorus going on because God has revealed something to them. And that's why we can't look at someone else and judge it. I know many people that have said from past experiences, why does everybody come in after the music? Oh, and they get all upset and all excited. This isn't drive time. I've heard that explained during the time of worship. This isn't a time to just rally the troops and get everybody to stop talking after the first or the second song. They're not there yet. God has not revealed to them a portion of himself where there's this response of an explosion of praise where they can't wait and they're compelled to respond to God in song and in hand waving and in clapping or whatever it is. We don't know what's happening to the person next to us, the person behind us, the person that's walking in the door 15 minutes late. We have no idea. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, this ceremony of consecrating the wall and the gates of the city was an act of piety. It was devotion on the part of Nehemiah. He desired to honor God, not merely to thank God in a general way for having been enabled to bring the building to a happy conclusion, but because the city was the place that God had chosen. It also contained the temple, which was hallowed by the manifestation of God's presence. That should have been exciting enough for the people at this time to have that raucous sound of joy heard so far away that they were once again together near the presence of God. It was on these accounts that Jerusalem was called the holy city by this public and solemn act of religious observance after a long period of neglect and desecration. It was, as it were, and you think about it, put yourself in the place of Ezra the priest and Nehemiah at this time, because at this time it's after all the kings have made a mess 
of Judah and Jerusalem and the, the northern kingdom. It, everything was a mess and there was all this neglect. And then here, the exiles can go back. They stop building the, the temple, the wall. And it was, as it were, restored back to its rightful proprietor. It's like as if they gave, they didn't give God anything, but in their hearts, they gave it back and dedicated it to God. That's why there was so much excitement. The dedication had the leading authorities accompanied by the Levitical singers summoned from all parts of the country by a vast concourse of people marched in an imposing procession around the city walls. They posed at intervals to, to engage in united praise and prayer and sacrifice. The purpose, pleading for the continued presence favor and blessing from God on this holy city that they lived in. These two companies of people gave thanks in the house of God. It, it, you look at it, it's like a church service. It really is. Verse 45, they performed the worship of their God, of the service of purification, together with the singers and the gatekeepers in accordance with the command of David and his son Solomon. This time, here in Nehemiah's day, was not the first time people celebrated God. Verse 46, for in the days of David and Asaph, in ancient times, there were leaders of the singers, songs of praise, hymns of thanksgiving to God. Verse 47, all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah gave the portions due to the singers. See, the reason why you read these things and it's easy just to read right past it. These singers were so serious with their walk with God, Nehemiah called them out as far as being worthy to be honorable, to take care of guarding the doors from enemies coming in. But there was laws instituted to take care of these singers because their job was that important. So you realize when you sing, in response to what God has done. There is something happening in you. It's a response, but there is something you're doing. You're warring against infiltration of the enemy. Because when you praise God, the enemy's gotta go. Because the, where the light is, the darkness flees. He, the, the, the enemy leaves. Matthew Henry commented on this, all of our cities, our houses, must have holiness to the Lord written upon them. The believer should undertake nothing which he does not dedicate to the Lord. We should be mindful to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts when any work for God is to pass through them. And who cleanses us? Christ alone. He's the only one that cleanses us. That's why when we sing, when we give, when we serve, we, we do it with clean hands and a pure heart, not because we cleaned ourselves up. God cleaned us. That's why the things we do in the name of God, they're honorable, because we come before him with, a clean, with clean hands and a pure heart. In Ephesians 5, 18, the B verse through 20, it says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. These, there are many people associated with the knowledge of God in their minds, but they don't know them in their hearts. There are people that are, and I'm not saying anyone here, so don't say, look, but there are people that walk into our churches and they don't know God. They know them here, but they don't know them here. They don't have a clue, no experience, no spiritual undertaking, n nothing, no connection, but they're full of head knowledge. You think of many of the cults that can recite Bible passages and the Christian stands next to them and says, I don't know any of that. How can this person? Because they have head knowledge. The true child of God has a heart knowledge. And when it's a heart knowledge, it's something God gives. Cannot be explained. Cannot be shown to someone else in a book. Because if you could, then man had something to do with it. When it's unexplained and it's inexpressible, you know that God has complete authority in it 
over it and through it. That's what makes it miraculous. Because God is in it, not man. Singing to the Lord is the same way. People can sing songs. They can have amazing voices. I sing in the choir at my church. And one lady that I used to know in a, church, a former church I went to said to me, Oh, if you want me to sing in any time, she had a great voice. If you want me to sing in any time, I'd love to sing with you guys. Just let me know and I'll come that day. And I went, she's not understanding. It's not a performance. It's not a concert. It's a reflection of what God has done and shown us. The Christmas songs, what a perfect example. O come all ye faithful. It's a reminder of what God has done in bringing us the Christ child. All the Christmas songs, all the Christian songs in our hymnals. It's pointing at God, pointing at God and looking at, we need to be, why do we read the Bible all the time? Well, I've read it once, why do we need to keep reading it? It's the same reason why in a chorus, that part that you sing several times is repeated. We need to be reminded because we're gonna forget how quickly we forget when bad things come up or any distraction comes along. We quickly forget. We respond in song with understanding in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the mind also. Singing to the Lord is more than a beat or a rhythm or melody that makes it real. The words we sing must resonate with our understanding of God who is and what he means in our lives. Singing with understanding gives us the connection in our minds and hearts with the beauty of knowing God. This one person pointed out several things about singing. Singing of God's love in Psalm 89.1. I will sing of the graciousness of the Lord forever. To all generations, I will make your faithfulness known with my mouth. You sing of what God has done and the freedom and joy you have in Psalm 68, verse 6. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Oh, I love that. Psalm 132, 9, may your priests be clothed with righteousness and may your godly ones sing for joy. Note this, joy from the Lord cannot be restrained. Remember when Jesus was walking on the road and the, and the Pharisees, tell your people to stop that and stop waving those palm branches. If they don't do that, the rocks will cry out. Joy cannot be restrained. We sing in times of trouble, speaking of not being restrained. In Acts 16, 25, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening. Don't you realize, church, brothers and sisters, our lives, our very lives are a song. And it's not when things are going good that people are looking at us when we're praise Jesus and got a song in our heart, but it's when we're shackled to a wall in a deep dungeon, like Paul and Silas. What were they singing? Woe is me, I don't think so. Maybe it was, I exalt thee. Who knows what they were singing? But they were singing something and it was God was all over it because the prisoners were listening. Our lives are a response to what God has done as Christians. And when we go through the darkest dungeons of our lives, when we respond with an inner joy that cannot be restrained, that's when the prisoners look and take notice of our realness. One man once said, and I like the um, analogy, when you squeeze toothpaste, what comes out of it? Toothpaste. You expect nothing else. When the Christian is squeezed and tested, what comes out? Is it Christ? We know we all fall short when, when that happens sometimes. We know that we've blown it terribly. Doubt, negativity, spewing awful things that a Christian mustn't speak. 
But then when we come to our senses like the prodigal, we know where to run. We run to our Father. And when the world sees the realness of a response to what God has allowed in our lives, Job, the Job song, we all know it. I think it's Matt Redman, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. When you look at the lyrics to that song, it's scripture. But when you can come out and say, blessed be the name of the Lord, when you've been squeezed and tested and tried. Hmm. Our other portion in Colossians, let peace, that peace that's in verse 15, it's a national and it's an individual peace. And that's why there's a soundness in it. It's not just for the individual. It's not just for the nation. It's both. It's a complete peace. When the peace of Christ, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule, when it rules in your hearts, a rule in your heart is an umpire. Now, an umpire, what do they do? They're watching what's coming. So your heart, what is God in your heart? The peace of Christ. The peace of Christ is the umpire in your heart that's looking at balls and strikes. That peace of God, we don't even know what's happening, but sometimes God reveals it. And again, that's when the song comes out. That's when we sing that new song that we didn't know we had in our hearts because the umpire, the peace of God, recognizes it, calls it out, and protects us from just getting blown around. With thankful because of it, in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell. Again, this is that knowledge and understanding thing. The word of Christ richly dwell, which means has a good influence within you, with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing, which is like prodding and poking others, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. We sing with gratitude. See, peace comes first. People that don't understand God, they say, oh, you Christians, you know, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Where's the peace? Well, the peace is in the Christian. Not you, if you're an unbeliever. You'll never understand this. The peace is in the Christian. What about the peace amongst men? It's between Christian mankind. It's the peace that this Christian has with that Christian, with that Christian, with that Christian. There's the peace amongst men. And that should speak volumes to the unbeliever to join us. But it's not going to be peace amongst unbelievers. That'll never happen. It can't. Because it's pure evil. Evil can't have peace. It's turmoil. That's all they've got. One man said, no heart is right with God where the peace of Christ does not rule. Wherever God's word is seriously read, heard, or preached, there is God himself. In that church or religious society where the truth of God is proclaimed and conscientiously believed, there is constant dwelling of God. Finally, in closing, psalms and hymns would be to be regarded as a method of teaching and admonishing. They were to be saturated with truth and such as to elevate the mind and withdraw it from error and sin. Matthew Henry said, we sharpen ourselves by quickening others. Imagine that. We sharpen ourselves by quickening other people. So our spirit speaks to other people's spirit when we relate the things of God to them. When we sing psalms, we make no, we make no melody unless we sing with grace in our hearts. We are affected when we sing and believe with true devotion and understanding. Singing of psalms is a teaching ordinance as well as a praising ordinance. We are not only to quicken and encourage others, but to teach and admonish one another. That's why well, another reason, it's another reason when Jesus says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. It's the corporate singing that goes on in the church that causes a oneness in the people to be reflected upon the words in the hymnals or on the screens to be focused on Christ, reminding that we're not alone because when we leave, we feel very alone in this world. But in that corporate church setting, we're reminded why Christ said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves because it's precious for us to be encouraged by one another. 
God inhabits our praise. You've heard that. It's in Psalm 22, 3. It says, yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. We feel God's love most keenly when we are focused on his will and have devoted ourselves fully to his praise and purpose for our lives. We are instructed to abide in God, which means that we should live and move to worship his name. The word abide carries with it a sense of inhabitation. We are committed to live in the presence of God. Do you know that the presence of God is inside every single one of God's children? So all we have to do is remember what we already have. And we are in the presence of God. And when we live in the presence of God, we will respond in song to the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for putting songs in our hearts. And Lord, when they seem far, far from us because we're distracted, we know that your grace and mercy will continue to wait and draw us close. We thank you, Lord, that you will never abandon us, that you are always with us. And we thank you, Lord, for those that you have inspired to write these great songs, put them to melody so that we can be reminded of your love, your presence, your commitment to each one of us and the hope of our heavenly home that awaits us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.